Hello everyone, my name is Daryl and I am part of the team here at Church of the Way here in Sebring and we are really glad you're joining us, albeit virtually. Um, we're glad for the opportunity to, uh, to spend some time together as we look at uh, what's book in the Old Testament of Zechariah. As way of introduction, um, it is official, I have realized yet again that I am boring. Uh, and you're like, oh, great, I'm going to click right off here and move on to the next. But hang with me. Uh, my, I say this because, uh, and one, my daughter has affirmed this recently as I made her watch a couple of these episodes. I, I say this because I enjoy, truly really do enjoy, uh, watching documentaries, documentaries by Ken Burns. You may remember Ken Burns is a, a famous uh, producer who, who makes documentaries. Um, for predominantly PBS, and you find he's done uh, docu series on everything from the Civil War to baseball to jazz music to Ernest Hemingway, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, just a myriad of topics and subjects that he has covered over the past uh, thirty years or so. Recently, I watched his eight-part series on country music and you're like oh and then I realized that I've just lost the rest of my audience in saying that uh, but again please hang with me but so I watched this eight-part series and it really was a fascinating and interesting series as it walked through the history of country music from its beginnings almost a century ago uh, or over a century to the to current times relatively I, I have to admit I'm not a biggest fan of country music and there was a season when I did listen to a lot of country music but not so much anymore um, but nonetheless it, it really was a, an interesting thing to watch and I maybe encourage you to watch it if you can find it but anyways there's a reason uh, I think country music has an enduring popularity it's been around for a long time and I think the reason is and the series really works to bring this out is that country music um, deals with hard things of life. It does deal with the celebrations and the fun and the laughter and the goofy stuff of life. Um, deals with love and all that stuff, the common stuff. But it also deals with the hard things. And you, you, No doubt you've heard the old joke, uh, what, do you, what do you get when you play a country song backwards and there's a Rascal Flatts song called Backwards that makes a joke of this. If you play a country song backwards, you, you get your job back, your wife back, your dog back, your truck back, your hair back. I mean, you get, you get it all back because country music so much is about what you've lost and what's, you know, the hardship and the pain and even no doubt. And, and so like the blues, which interestingly had is a very, very strong influence on country music, like the blues, country music deals with the very things in life that maybe some other genres don't. They deal with losing your job. They deal with your relationships and, and marriages falling apart or, or on the rocks or, you know, whatever. They deal with that stuff, sometimes in a comical way and sometimes in a serious way. They deal with death. They deal with, and you're like, wow. And that's life, though, isn't it? So in the second uh, episode of the series, um, called Hard Times, a series on country music, the second episode is called Hard Times. In the background is, is Ken introduces, as they introduce the, what's going to happen in that episode, in the background is a song I'd never heard before. The song is called Hard Times uh, Come Around No More. And it was written in the mid-1800s by, by a guy named Stephen Foster, and, and it's being sung in the, in the show... Um, by Mavis Staples, and there's this great line in this in the in this song, and it's beautifully sung. And um, in the and I won't sing it. Don't worry, because then it really will. Everyone will jump off and watch something else. But there's this great line, and the, and the line says, "Many days you have lingered around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more." At many days, hard times, you've lingered around my cabin door and you come around no more. Everyone can relate to that. We, 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 it's a beautiful picture of, man, hard times coming. It's like they just hang around. And you want them to leave, but they just keep hanging around the door. They're right there. And here's this song that's saying, come again no more, leave. 
So you can use this song to introduce um, introduce the, 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 the episode that dealt with the history of country music during the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. And so, and he's introducing this. And because what's interesting is country music sang, obviously, about the hard times of the Great Depression. In particular, there was this uh, family called the Carter family who kind of came on the scene during this time. Uh, many consider the Carter family the original family of country music. And they sang a song that, that painted or illustrated the, the strident realities of, of life during the Great Depression in Appalachia. Where, and, it, it, and it's just, it's devastating. It's loss. It's sc scary and all this stuff. And yet, they sing of the song. The song is, there's no depression in heaven. The song says, it paints this re realistic picture of what the Great Depression means for the people of Appalachia and the rest of the country. And yet, it goes on to state the one place, the song is about the one place that the Great Depression hasn't affected. And it sings about heaven, is heaven being the one place that, you know what, there's no depression. There's another old song that many of you know, um, and uh, the Nitty Gritty the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band does a great rendition of it. It's called "Can the Circle Be Unbroken." In, in the opening line, or one of the lines of the song, tells us what the song is about. What's happening in the song is a, is someone's looking out the window on a cold, dreary, cloudy day, and they're watching the hearse curse bring his mother. So it's a song about the death of his mother and there's this line that, you know, driver, please drive slow because <laughs> you're carrying my mother. And there's, but yet where does this song point our attention to, where does this song find hope? Where does the, the songwriter find relief and find comfort? Where? He finds it by looking beyond death. Because there's the chorus, if you will, Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. So here's this poetic picture, this poetic reminder of, of Can the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord? Oh, there's a better home waiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Yeah, things are bad, and it's cloudy, and it's dreary, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm literally at the funeral of my mother, and yet I know that there is a better place waiting. A better place waiting for my mom, if she knew you. A better place for me as your follower. In this place in the sky, Lord. In the sky. Maybe you... And another great influence of, the, of country music was, was the whole gospel, the genre, music genre of gospel. You have the old gospel songs of like peace in the valley and so on. And we could all you could Google and look up more and maybe you know many more. And again, the point is, in face of the hardships of life, these songs they 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 give the cathartic effect of 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 expressing the hardships. But where do they pull our attention? Where do they say we can find hope and comfort? And and they pull our attention to the life beyond, to the life of heaven and God and His, and the future that we have with Him. Because the reality is hard times do come. They come around more, more often than we want. So do we give up? Do we give in? Do we soldier on? How do we do that? These songs, these songs, I believe, they point us, point us in the right direction. And the direction they point us in is is one that's not new. It's not new with country music. It's not new with the blues. It's not new with the gospel music. These these songs, whether it's country these country songs or or the old gospels and stuff, they follow a pattern, a very ancient pattern, a very ancient model, if you will, a model that we've talked about before, especially as we've walked through these these minor prophets and, and even the major prophets of you know, Daniel and Ezekiel, or the miners of Malachi, or not Malachi, of Habakkuk, and so forth. 
there's this pattern, there's this model that, that we will see again today, I believe, as we look at the book of Zechariah. That pulls that says, when life is hard, we recognize that life is hard, but we look beyond those hardships to God who loves us and is with us and has promised something better. See, for God through this through the prophet Zechariah is going to show a hurting people, a hurting people were there to look during hard times. When hard times linger outside your door, when hard times were lingering outside the, the Jewish people's door, where were they to look? And Zech, God is going to remind his people that they are to look to him. And they are to look to his promised coming Messiah, Savior, Deliverer, who, Rescuer, who was coming. And more than almost, almost any other book in the Old Testament... <laughs> This book shows us exactly who that Savior is, as Jesus Christ. So please turn to the book of Zechariah, and we will we'll dip our toes into it, if you will. As you do so, the background is, again, remember that this, is, this book, Zechariah, uh, timeline-wise, is right on the heels of the book of Haggai. And by the way, if you um, look below the screen, below your viewer, you'll see some show notes and some notes, and hopefully, hopefully we'll have the uh, handout that you can download and print off um, that, that will give some a basic outline, as well as a couple questions and an opportunity to write down how it's encouraged in some application for your life. So I encourage you to do that. But as you will do so, and if you look on the back of that handout, you'll see that Haggai, Haggai and Zechariah were contemporaries. And in fact, so what has happened is, again, that the Jewish people, the Israelites, after being exiled and run off their land and, and everything destroyed by, the, by Babylon or the Assyrian nations, um, has been invited by the Persian Empire to, they said, hey, you can go back to Jerusalem. And so many of the Jewish people came back to Jerusalem and began to rebuild their lives, rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. And, and so we read about this in, uh, in the book of Ezra or in the book of Nehemiah. These are great books to, to give the historical account of these two books of Zechariah and Haggai. But what we learned last week was that during, the time of, during this time, the people did come back and they did start to, to rebuild their, their lives and their cities and they started rebuilding their homes and they even started rebuilding the temple. They laid the foundation and stuff. But... Then they got discouraged, and then they stopped. They stopped rebuilding the temple. They went on to finish up their homes, and their homes were quite luxurious and, and nice, but uh, they kind of got discouraged and didn't build the temple for various reasons. In fact, they stopped for 16 years. And so Haggai shows up, and he calls them out on it. And God says, listen, God, through the prophet Haggai, says, Hey, your priorities are all messed up. <laughs> you, you built your homes, but you didn't build mine. And so the people responded well, and they started rebuilding the temple. They got to work, if you will. She, like, literally within like two months, uh, they started getting discouraged. And they started getting discouraged because the realities that they were facing, although they lived in nice homes at, that t at this time, they were facing enormous economic hardships. Famine and... And, and loss of resources, and, and, and it was just hard. And then, now they want to rebuild the temple, and the reality is they just don't have anything really to rebuild the temple with. How in the world are they going to do this? And so they got discouraged. So as whereas Haggai re, is, is a strong rebuke, enter Zechariah. And the book of Zechariah is one of the most comforting books, especially one of the most comforting prophetic books that we come across. And it's interesting for me to contemplate, and I encourage you to do so, why God responds this way at this time to these people. Think of this. Um, and by the way, the book, is, the book of Zechariah is filled with with fantastic and, and complicated and, and mysterious imagery and visions and dreams and it's like what does that mean and what is that I don't know what that means and 
please don't be discouraged. We're, and we don't have time to dive into all the imagery and explore what each one is or could be. But but there's so much here, and there's so much that we do understand that's, that's right on the surface that we can say, oh man, that is helpful. That is comforting. For, for example, look at chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Verse 16, Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt. And the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Proclaim further, this is what the Lord Almighty says, My towns will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose, and choose Jerusalem. <laughs> right off the bat. So you can read this, and to me this sentence, this, these two verses, is really the, the rest of the book is, is showing how God is going to do that. And he's saying, listen, take comfort. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Jerusalem. I'm coming back, he says. And once again, the towns will be will, will overflow with prosperity. And if, 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 particularly for these people at this time, this would be an enormous shot of encouragement. Wait, God's not done. He's coming back and, and prosperity and he's going to restore things. Great. He's going to rebuild the temple. Or continuing on chapter 2, verse 10. It says, shout and be glad, daughter Zion. And, and I wonder, by the way, he says, shout and be glad. It probably in contrast to what they were actually doing. He said, no, you need to shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming. And speaks to the Lord. And I will live among you, declares the Lord. The Lord Almighty says, I am coming. I am coming and I'm going to live among you. This is, this is so comforting. And it goes on, by the way, to, it goes on to express what, what, what the, that day, that future day, if it, in that day there will come a Messiah, a deliverer, a Savior, sent from God, and He's coming, and He's going to rescue. So hang in there, be patient in the midst of your hardship. But see, all this sounds good, except as I said before, the Jewish people, as they look to rebuild the temple, as, they, as they're working along, things are still hard. Maybe they're a little hungry. Maybe the, the, the store, things are getting expensive, or the, there's not as many resources, or they got to travel far to go get them. I, I don't know. But we do know things are hard. And so how are they to do it? How in the world is this to succeed? This is so far beyond them to build the temple, even if it's a smaller, uh, reduced, t a smaller temple that's less grand as the, than, the, than the original. How are they in the world they can, then can they do this? Chapter 4 helps us out. God helps them out by telling them, reminding them something. Chapter 4, verse 6. The Lord said, so he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, who was the leader of the Jewish people, the governor of the land. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. How are they to accomplish all of the things that God is commanding and inviting them to do? How can they do it? How? It's so daunting. It's, it's downright monumental. How can they do it? Not by might or by power, but by the spirit of the Lord. Um, Paul picks up on this idea in 1 Corinthians, and this, this idea, we, we've, we've all read this and heard this. It's by, by walking in obedience in the Spirit of the Lord, by His power, His leading, His, His enabling, that things that we can accomplish what He's inviting us to. It'll, everything else will fail. If we try to do it on our own, done. But if we lean and trust and follow and allow God to do what He's doing, <laughs> yeah, that's how... This all happens and gets done. It's by His power and His power alone. So the first section acts as this massive chunk of encouragement. Basically, these first almost six chapters minus the introduction. The first six chapters are this, inter this uh, encouragement to what the Jewish people were facing at that time, particularly. All the while, again, giving nod and, and pointing to the future and to future events like, I will come and I am coming and I will return, just as we've read. But primarily, it's dealing with what they were facing at that time. Now, chapter 7 and 8 in this next section of, of this book deal with a couple things. First, it deals with how they are to worship 
and then also deals with how they are to live. So, so roughly speaking, chapter 7, it, it answers, asks this interesting question. The people ask, okay, the temple's being rebuilt. And when this temple's being rebuilt, are we to continue fasting on, uh, on these various days? Because what they would do, what happened was, after the destruction by Babylon, destruction of the original temple, they instituted a, a practice of fasting in, in, as an act of mourning for the destruction of the temple. So regularly for the, like the past 70 years, they would mourn over the destruction of the temple by fasting. Now, God's response, interesting, I'll let you read it on your own. Uh, to me, it, it, it's, he asked the, God kind of turns the question around and he says, Hey, are you sorry? Are you mourning because the temple was destroyed because of your sin and disobedience to me? Or are you mourning because you're actually sorry for your sin? It, it's kind of like he asks, are you sorry that you got caught? Or are you just truly sorry that you blew it a lot, repeatedly, for a long time? Are you sorry for your sin or are you just sorry that you got caught in your sin? And you're just experiencing the consequences of it. Nonetheless, he, he, he deals with, he says, so they, um, how are they to deal? Should they continue fasting and mourning? He says, no, the answer, God answers basically that they are to continue to follow God and follow God fully. Uh, chapter 8, by the way, speaks of, of more or less how they are to live once the temple's built and as they return and worship God and, and, and they, you know, they live their lives, how are they to live? How are they to treat one another? Uh, look at chapter 8, or verse 16 and 17, answers the question more or less. It says, these are the things you are to do. Yeah? Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other, and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. Now, if you've been following in our series on this, the Minor Prophets, this idea of speaking truthfully and, and having righteous and up and uh, and honorable and just courts and, and, and judgments from the judicial system, for, that this is important to God, being this is what they're to be. This is not something brand new. This, are you, with, to, to treat each other with respect and honor and truthfully. The courts are to be, uh, not to be corrupt as they, as they all too often were in Israel's history. None of this is new. God is simply reminding them, hey, this is, this is how you're to worship and this is how you're to live. Nothing new. But the last section, last major section of the book, chapters 9 through 14, the, through the end of the book, are not just the encouragement for what they're facing right then, and the contemporary issues that they were facing, with a nod to the future. The, the last chapters of this book, they point to something grander. They point to the Messiah. What God wants them to think about, what God wants them to focus on, what God wants them to lean into and to trust and to bank on when life is hard is the Messiah, is the, the future Messiah, the Savior, and His kingdom. And so in, in, in vivid imagery and, and, and just incredible visions and, and prophecies, Zechariah paints a, a beautiful picture of the Messiah and his kingdom. And, and ultimately, it is all about Jesus. That's the beauty of this book, particularly for us who, who live after the life of Christ. Because this book, like I said, almost uh, except for maybe Isaiah or Jeremiah, speaks more about what the Messiah and who the Messiah is and the prophecies about him than any other Old Testament book. God is pulling their attention to the Messiah that's going to come in the one future day. And if, as we read this book, we can recognize who that Messiah is as being Jesus. Chapter 3 in this book um, speaks of the angel of the Lord, and it is a, an explicit reference to Jesus. By the way, chapter 3, verse 8, um, and chapter 6 through 12, uh, chapter 3 through 
verse 8 says this, um, Listen, High Priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of all things to come, I am going to bring my servant, speaking of this Messiah, this future servant, I am going to bring my servant the branch. And so, in chapter 6, um, speaks of this as well. And that this Messiah, this future Savior, this future one who's going to come back and, and rule, and he, he was going to be the, the perfect priest and the perfect king. He was going to rule righteously and perfectly, and, 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 and he was going to um, wipe away and, and save people from their sins and w deal with the sin of Israel and, and bring purity. And all this stuff he's going to do. This, this one, was, he was going to be called the branch. Isaiah, by the way, speaks of this Messiah as, as being the, the shoot or the branch of Jesse, which is meaning from the family of King David. So this branch was going to come from this Messiah, was going to come from the line of King David. Well, the book of Matthew, as you know, opens up with a very careful account showing exactly how Jesus is the branch that came from the line of David. He's the branch promised in the book of Zechariah. Chapter 9, verse 9, speak, says this about this coming king, this coming Messiah, this coming Savior. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Zechariah, hundreds of years before Jesus, says, listen, rejoice, rejoice Israel, rejoice Zion in Jerusalem. See, your king comes riding on a donkey, a lowly foal of a donkey. And it, 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 there's some implications here, but we this should sound familiar. How did Jesus enter the enter Jerusalem leading up to his death and his death on the cross? How did he enter Jerusalem? But riding on a donkey, on the foal of a donkey. This book. So God says, "Listen, listen." People, listen, Jewish people, listen, Israelites, as you as you rebuild this temple and you're getting discouraged and you're facing hard times, I want you to remember, I want you to focus, I want you to look towards that day because I'm coming, that future time when the Messiah, the King will come and he's going to come on a donkey. And they're probably thinking, what, coming on a donkey, but okay. And lo and behold, we know here comes Jesus walking on a donkey. And so we read this and you're like, wait, who am I to look to? The Messiah. Who's the Messiah? We know him as Jesus. For example, continuing on, look at uh, chapter 11. Chapter 11 through 4 through 13. We can read this on your own. Speaks of the good shepherd being sold for 30 pieces. And that 30 pieces given to a potter. Book of Matthew is very, uh, the Gospels are very clear that Judas betrayed Jesus for, well, 30 pieces of silver. And that 30 pieces of silver were used to buy a field from a potter. And so, once again, it's in, in, in imagery that it's like wow, it's striking and vivid and maybe a little mysterious, and we're not quite tracking with it, but we can track with 30 pieces of silver. That sounds familiar. And so we turn to the Gospels and we read what happens. And so now we can look, we can literally take Jesus and put him back into Zechariah and see the story of God's redemptive plan to rescue his people and rescue his followers as coming through Jesus. Chapter 13, verses 7 through 9 speak of, of the good shepherd. Uh, Jesus says, by the way, I am the good shepherd. Speaks of the good shepherd as being struck down. It's being struck down in the sheep scatter. Jesus, by the way, says that this is exactly what's going to happen. He says to his disciples, like, I'm going, and you guys are, I'm going to be, he quotes this stuff. Jesus is the one spoken of in chapter 14 as the Messiah who's coming back to rescue and save his people. 
and there's so much more. There's 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 others references and messianic and prophecies that are fulfilled by Jesus in his incarnation. Now, what's interesting about the book of Zechariah is Zechariah does not distinguish between the incarnation of Jesus in the, as the Messiah and the, his, the final fulfillment in the establishment of his kingdom on earth forever. Um, we understand that to be uh, as, as being started by his incarnation when, he, when he, um, Jesus became a man, as you know, we celebrate at Christmas. And then the Bible speaks of a future day in the future when Christ will return. He comes a second time, if you will, and he will reestablish and, and do all this stuff and establish his kingdom and make all things right and stuff that we've talked about before. Zechariah doesn't distinguish between the two, so they kind of get mushed together. But that's okay, and that's, that's fine, because what we can do is we can say, hey, these are the parts that, yeah, Jesus was sold for, for was betrayed for 30 um, pieces of silver and he rode in on a donkey and all this other stuff and that came true and so then when we read this other stuff it's like man this stuff came true this stuff will come true also because that's that's a couple things come to mind as I read this the first is this and we've, I've said this all the time and I've said it all the time intentionally this book this Zechariah like countless other books before in the in the Bible illustrate over and over and over and over and over again that when God said he's going to is going to do something he does it it's guaranteed it's going to happen and because he's God and he has all the power and all the might he can make it happen and make sure it happens the, the second thing that kind of comes to the surface for me on this is is the tone of this book God is bending over backwards God is graciously comforting his followers, comforting his people, his hurting people. And he's coming alongside them. He says, listen, it's going to be okay. I'm coming back. I, I'm coming back and I'm going to establish my kingdom. And I know things are hard now, but let me tell you, just hang in there because it will change. This isn't forever. What's interesting, by the way, is God calls his people, when you read this, in the beginning, in a couple of various times, he, he points back to, to Israel, their forefathers' um, disobedience. So God calls Israel back, and he does this in other books in the Bible as well, other prophetic books, to remember the past. What's interesting to me is when, when I think of how I view the past, oftentimes I view the past in nostalgic terms with great nostalgia and, and and oftentimes when I hear people say this you know they're like if only we could go back if we could go back to the good old days and in doing so yeah there's a lot of good in the old days but we kind of gloss over a lot of bad in the old days too there was hardship and pain and death and sickness and and doubt and fear in the old days as well and, and so God doesn't say to to the people of Zechariah's time, he doesn't say, hey, you know what I want you to I want you to remember that old temple, and I want you to focus, and I want you to just feel bad, because you know what? It ain't going to happen, man. Sorry. No. What does he do? He's, he doesn't say, look back in nostalgic terms. When God says, tells his people to look back, <laughs> he tells his people to look back and remember their sin. He tells his people to look back and remember their unfaithfulness, particularly in light of God's faithfulness that, that he... Um, exercised and showed in spite of their unfaithfulness. So God says, listen, I want you to remember your sin, not to not to, um, to defeat you or to crush you. I want you to remember your sin, one, that you don't repeat it, but two, that you'll remember my faithfulness in the midst and in spite of your unfaithfulness. So we are to look back. And, that, and this book reminds me of that. And it is good to look back, but I need to look back and basically remember the faithfulness of God. Because if we look back with in nostalgic terms, that doesn't really help us, does it? Because one, we can't go back to the way things were, because that's back then. And they weren't that good anyways. We need to look ahead. And what are we to look ahead? We look back and we remember as we move forward. Our greatest source of comfort, let me put it this way, our greatest source of comfort is that God is with us now, as he said, he, as he's promised, 
and our greatest source of comfort is our promised future with him as Christ's followers. See, the, the, this theological understanding puts today in perspective. It puts the hardships that we, you and I, may be facing today in perspective, in their proper place, if you will. And gives you and me strength to move forward as we trust God and look to we look past those hardships to a future with God forever, a future when the hardships aren't there. Let's be blunt. Application. Two things come to mind. One, uh, two, one, read, and two, write. Let me encourage you, and, and I know this is kind of maybe a big application or a big uh, assignment. I don't mean it that way. But let me encourage you to read the book of Zechariah. Read it with a, a pencil and paper. And as you read it, just, just take note of things like the tone of the book. How is God comforting his people? What is he showing? What, what is he saying? What is he, how is he saying it? What imagery is he using? Why? Basically, hear the heart of God as he comforts his people. Because in reality, through his word, this word is given to you and to me to comfort us as well as his followers. And as you read the book of Zechariah, maybe skip over to the book of Matthew. Or you could look at John, but Matthew's probably a good spot. And just skim through the book of Matthew. And remind yourselves of the, of the events and the story of Jesus recorded in the Gospels. So as you read the book of Zechariah, maybe some of those things will kind of, like, oh, that sounds familiar. Like we've talked about before, like Jesus riding in on a donkey or, or, or being pierced. And Jesus, his, his side was pierced to Zechariah said that this, this Messiah would be pierced. And yet Matthew in the Gospels record that Jesus, they pierced Jesus' side and he was pierced for our transgressions. Or even, even the most basic of them all, Jesus, he says the Messiah is coming. And we read in literally the first, couple, first chapter of Matthew, or second chapter, that he arrives. Maybe, maybe, maybe we should do it this way. We read, we read Matthew, we read Zechariah, we read Matthew, maybe we read, we skim through the book of Revelation as we look at it and we see the, the, the end of the story, if you will, and all the fantastic and, 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 and wonderful and scary and mysterious events of Revelation. As we skim through that, we'll probably pick up on some imagery of Revelation that pops up in Zechariah. Maybe the two will coincide. Maybe make note of that. Or maybe it's, we should write down what God has promised to do, maybe in the book of Zechariah. Write down what God has promised to do for you, for his followers, for people who have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. What did he promise his people, the Jewish people and the Israelites? And what did he do? So write down the promises that he did, made and did. Did and fulfilled, I should say. Then write down the promises that he's made that he hasn't fulfilled fully yet. For example, um, God has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. He's, a couple times in the Old Testament, and he said this, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he's made that promise, and he's made that promise to his followers, to you and to me as, as Christians. Now, we haven't uh, experienced life fully, so that promise isn't fully realized, that makes sense? It's like, okay, I've written that down. God has promised that he's coming back. He's going to come back and he will establish his kingdom forever and ever. I write that down. That he will defeat evil and sickness and injustice and, and he will make all things right. And he will de defeat all the wickedness and, and, and the, the horrible nations and all the people that come against him will be defeated. He, he's promised that in Revelation that he will create a whole new heaven and earth and where there is no more pain or sickness or sorrow and the streets are gold and all that stuff. He's promised that he will do that. He's promised that if you call on him and trust, in him, trust him as your Lord and Savior, he will do just that. Oh, man. He's promised that he loves you 
He's promised that he wants to comfort you. All these things. And so when we start writing this stuff down, and what my, my point is this, I want us to begin to see and to look at all the promises that he made and to see all the promises that he made and that he kept, particularly through Jesus. So as Jesus enters the scene, fulfilling all these promises that he made in, say, the book of Zechariah, because he kept those promises, now as I look to the other promises that he's made, I have good evidence, I have concrete evidence that he will keep them. So all the promises of, of what Jesus is going to do and what Jesus was going to do, that Jesus did do, namely die on the cross for my sin and your sin and for the Jewish people's sins, so that anyone who believes in him will be forgiven and have eternal life forever and ever. That anyone will be able to live and walk by the Spirit and to work in, with the Spirit and to see the power of the Spirit work in their lives and to accomplish what only God can do. All of that is made possible because of the fulfilled promise of Jesus showing up on the scene and dying on the cross and raising from the dead and all that. And so now I have that assurance now as I look and walk through current hardships that I may be facing, even as a Christ follower, whether it's economic strife, problems or relational problems or even facing death itself, as someone who knows Christ, we can have the assurance that he will keep all of these other promises as well. Things like, if I die, I am with God forever. That one day he's creating a place for me as his followers. He's going to come back and he's going to establish all the things we've just talked about. <laughs> See, that gives us the strength. That, that's the comfort we need. See, that's comforting and that's where we find when hard times lingering outside our door. Because what Zechariah shows us and points us who Zacharias points to Jesus. Who he points to that is Jesus, the Messiah, the long-awaited one. That Jesus, he comes to the door, our door too. Hard times linger and they hang around and we want to kick them out. But when Jesus comes to our door, he knocks, doesn't he? And we can read this in the end of the Bible. Jesus knocks at our door and he asks, he yearns to be invited into our lives. So that in accepting him into our lives, trusting him as our Lord and Savior, trusting him that in the work that he did on the cross, asking that to be applied to us, <laughs> he enters our home, our lives, our heart, our soul, and that we have a relationship with him forever. And so now the one who is with us is the one who has defeated the I'll use this metaphorically as the song does. He's defeated the hard times. He's defeated death itself, the hardest of all hard times, and granted us eternal life. That's good news, isn't it? That's good news. So when our, when our lives sure look more like a country western song, <laughs> we can do what some of the songs do. We can do what gospels. We can do what Zechariah, more importantly does. We look to Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah. We look to him as our hope, as our, assure, as our sure hope, as our confident hope, as the one who is, has kept his promises and will keep all the other ones that he's promised as well. And we can bank on that. We can rest on that. We can have peace in that. And that's good news. Let's pray. Again, God, we just come to you and we thank you for this book. We thank you for this book of Zechariah. We thank you for the, for the myriad of, of um, passages that point directly to Jesus. That as we read the Gospels, we recognize that Jesus fulfilled so much of this. And we, we, we find the, the confidence and the hope that you kept your word, just as you said you would. You kept your word, and now we have the assurance that you'll keep everything else that you said you would do. God, thank you that anyone who calls on you will be saved. Thank you as the, the long-awaited Messiah that you came as the, the King 
as our Savior, that you were pierced, that you were struck down, that you were killed on our behalf. Thank you that as we look to you, we find salvation, we find forgiveness, and we find eternal life. We love you in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Have a fantastic week, and we hope to see you again next week. Take care.